All right, thank you for coming. Uh, I have some hard competition after John's talk. I don't have any flying Je Jedi mind trick things, but I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Maybe mine is more accessible, so we'll see. So, uh, I have a lot of different technologies that I'm just going to give you a quick overview on just to show you what's available and then examples of how to put it together. Um, some of the initial introduction slides I'm, I'll go over quickly, otherwise I'm not going to make it to the end and to the questions. Um, so I'll give you a quick overview of what Mr. Howell says uh, later on. Then uh, look at the, some uh, home automation solutions. You may be familiar with some. The problems they are not all the same in every country. Um, protocols to talk to, all that fun stuff. Um, thermostats that you can um, program and read from. And also another way of doing uh, power monitoring, uh, at least the best one I found when I was buying uh, and looking at different solutions. Um, a few ways of how to, uh, to do programming in, in Perl with Mr. House. I apologize to some of those, uh, those who get offended by the Perl word. And um, then examples of how to put this uh, everything together. So, um, I thought I would actually start with the fun part. <laughs> the stupid cat. So, people who have a cat know that they know what not to do. They're very smart animals. They also know when they can get away with it. So, that's exactly what they do. Uh, regular people will go to the pet shop and buy something simple, uh, maybe a $20 device that has a motion sensor and make some noise to scare the cat off the counter or the plant or the couch or whatever you have. But what's the, the problem with this is you didn't build it, so that's not fun. And you don't get to see what happened because that happens when you're at home, so you don't know if it worked. So that, you know, there was a satisfaction in that. That's just no good. Um, and my cat is a little bugger. He does it at night, too, so that makes it even harder. Stupid animal. Um, so, when, uh, one way to take care of that, uh, I can't take credit for it. It's called Blender Defender. I just saw it on the internet. You can Google it. There's apparently many hits now. Um, using a blender on your kitchen counter uh, to scare the cat off the kitchen counter. That's obviously a normal way of doing that. And that's a good way to put Perl and your PC and home automation into the mix which is obviously the proper way of doing it. Um, so to detect the cat, uh, motion sensor, uh, infrared-based, is not so good because it doesn't show you which piece moved. It's kind of a crude uh, sensor, and it could detect it moving around the other things moving around, which you don't want to trigger bad noises in the middle of the night. Um, so I'm using motion-based uh, uh, linked to a small uh, video camera, and this would actually let me say which piece of the screen I want to detect motion on, and do things with it. if the light switch is on enough to do smart things with that. The motion code is actually very nice. You can find it on the web. Um, but that only works if the light is on. So I'll show you the next picture. Um, let's see if this, this works. So here I have the little uh, infrared sensor. When that detects movement, I have it turn on the lights so that the camera under it can actually see what's going on. Then motion will start recording frames and seeing if anything moves. That's the uh, attack zone for the cat. Uh, coming from the car just over there that you don't see. And that is the blender plugged into a little on-off power switch. And the end result is having a little talk with your cat even if you're not there. So hopefully that plays. Coming at night. And there we go. All right. So that was that. Um, <laughs> so now I have to say this one's good, but my cat is not as athletic as some other ones. That's the original <laughs> website it came from. Um, I was trying to replicate this, but mine is not as good. Although I do enjoy the original videos. They work quite well. I, had, I still have to work on the, the backflip, but anyway. So that was that. I'll go back to slideshow. All right. Thank you. Next slide. So back to work. Um, this is one of the things you can do. Uh, I don't make stuff fly, but still, you can have a little bit of fun. So Mr. House, uh, out of curiosity, who uses Mr. House here? Two people went? All right, awesome. You came to the right talk then. So Mr. House is basically how to do automation without having a bunch of cron jobs that don't have state in between and don't really know what's going on. I mean, I, I had a cron tab initially, which turned turn lights on and off and did simple things, but it becomes, it goes out of, uh, comes, becomes pretty complicated and just uh, grows out of hand. And that's what Mr. House was written for. Uh, I'm not the author, by the way. Um, 
but it was written to keep state, keep track of what time it is, the temperature right now, the weather tomorrow, um, the lights and so forth, and do something composite based on all that. Um, some, an example is you have a light switch that turns the light on and off outside, and you have motion sensors that also turn the light on and off. You want logic to keep track of if the motion sensor says, okay, no one moved, I should turn the light back off. If I use the uh, switch to turn it on myself, I don't want the motion sensor timeout to turn the light back off when I myself turn it on with the switch. So the switch is an override and then turns off the motion sensor logic for a period of time. And that's the kind of logic where you need more code behind. It seems pretty simple until you do it and you're like, oh crap, I forgot about that. So that's why Mr. House does a pretty good job. Um, it's in Perl, so it works everywhere, uh, even on small router devices, uh, low power, 5, 10 watts. Um, and it supports so many protocols, it's actually pretty impressive for that. Now, you have to plug things into it. So you probably have heard or know about X10. Um, who uses X10 here, out of curiosity? Who likes it? I see the hands going down. No, oh, half of them? OK. Um, so X10 was the original way of talking to your uh, lights and power plugs. It's pretty simple. It's cheap. I mean, it's 10 bucks a device or even less now. Uh, you can't go wrong with that. But it's very brain dead. There's no feedback. You don't know um, if the signal got anywhere. It just has a lot of uh, flaws. I'll go into them in more details. Um, Instant is a way to do X10 better. I'll just give you a quick overview of that. Z-Wave is the wireless version. UPB is another one in the US. There's a few competitors. And another way still is to use uh, something like one wire to use a wired way that's not your power lines to actually toggle, uh, toggle things on and off. Because the power lines in your house could be kind of dirty. Uh, by dirty, I mean that the uh, UPS you plugged in or the fridge, when it turns on, it puts a lot of crap on the, on the power line. And then your little signals that we're trying to get somewhere don't go anywhere anymore. Uh, so the quick introduction to extend, which might still be the best way for people to start here, just because it's so cheap and easy to get. Um, it works on the house codes and device codes. Uh, it was meant to have 16 houses that would not interact with one another, but really uh, we just use multiple house codes within the same house for our zones. And you just say, turn A1 on, and any device that has the code A1 will turn on or off. There's no confirmation. You don't know um, if the device actually turned on or what state it's in later. And it's just not very reliable. But for most intents and purposes, it works well enough. Just don't put your fish tank and things that people depend on, uh, like food for an animal uh, and survival things uh, on that, <laughs> unless you don't like your animals somehow. All right, so uh, that's pretty much for the slide. I'll let you read it quicker. Um, XNRF is an RF extension of it. It has the same principle for, of house codes. Uh, there is the same thing, no retries, no acknowledgments, but it does send the RF signal three to five times, just in case the first time it didn't get through. Um, and the default kits have a little power plug that, with an antenna coming out that will gateway the RF back to your power line. And that works, but it's pretty restrictive. The antennas don't go very far. And there's a delay of up to two seconds by the time it makes it to your PC to see what, what went on. So it's cheap, but it's not the best solution. The better solutions would be um, little devices that you can plug in your PC directly, like CM26A or WA800 or FXCOM. You can Google all those. It's probably a good idea to look at the slides later because it's just too much information to all write down. Um, and those basically have antennas that are much more, uh, much better tuned. Uh, the range is much better than like an entire house or even outside. People say they can reach a fair amount of distance. And it goes directly to your PC, so you don't go through the power line anymore if you're doing RF. And that's more, uh, much more effective and a lot faster. Now it's like half a second to get something. So when you push a button to turn the music off running on your MP3 player, you don't have to wait two seconds wondering if it went through. All right, that picks you up that. Um, that's a, when you have the external devices, you can actually make a better antenna. That's a quarter plane antenna uh, based on the signal length. That one's a 310, uh, 310 megahertz, so it's about nine inches. And that lets you reach uh, devices uh, much farther. That's another example of antenna um, in the attic. Uh, make sure that basically you can uh, get all the way to your neighbor's house and don't have any reception problems. That's one of the receivers I was talking about, uh, the R W800. Uh, it's in, this one is the serial version. They like to sell you the USB version now because, of course, USB is better. But the thing about serial is you can 
have a little Cat5 adapter and have a long Cat5 cable so that you can have it far away from your PC. It's usually a good thing to put in the attic if you can. The problem with the USB is USB extenders are kind of expensive. Uh, you can't run a long USB cable, as some of you probably know. So this is just the easy way to go, in my opinion. And then the, the cable here, you can just have any antenna like you saw in the previous slide. Extensec is a yet another protocol, still from the same company, but they had to make it incompatible somehow. Uh, it's mostly used for those cheap little DS10 sensors, which are on-off uh, sensors you put on windows and doors, or garage doors, or mailboxes. Um, those are really cheap. I think I got them like three for ten dollars or something like that, because it's just old technology that no one wants. Uh, so that means it's great for us to use. And same thing with the same receiver and antenna that you saw receive those signals, so you can put it in the house. That's an example of the mailbox, for instance. All right, I hope you have uh, your, uh, your camera so you can write down quickly. That's the code you need. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, basically, you can go back at the slide. But just to give you an idea of how it works in Mr. House, um, I've defined by garage, uh, one and two doors, uh, my mailbox. And those are objects in Mr. House. When uh, it's an event loop, so when I'm going through the event loop and the state changes, I get a state now uh, variable. And from here, I can see what the old state was and if it changed. I can then send an email saying your garage door opened or stuff like that. I can also get in a, more importantly an event if the garage door did not get closed after 10 minutes. And so that's one of the things that Mr. House does is I can have a, t a timer here that I set. So after those timers are set at the bottom, if they don't get reset and uh, canceled, this is more for reading the slide later again. Um, if the timers don't disappear, I get an email saying, hey, you know, this has been inactive for too long or uh, your garage door didn't get closed. You might want to check it out. Instern. Uh, so Instern is mostly extend on write. Um, they have recent. They have acknowledgments. You can actually create the state of a device, which is something you would want. Uh, I don't know why Extend didn't do it. Um, Adobe is actually is pretty cool, except the part, this little part at the bottom. Uh, between the time I wrote the slides and the time I came here, they announced that they were not actually going to sell them in, the, in here in Australia. So sorry for you. Uh, you have to find something else. I'm sure there's comp uh, competition, and really, it doesn't matter what you use uh, for I.O. as long as you have something you can plug and then talk to. But uh, Instant basically is uh, the same principle. It still uses 5-volt DC, um, but it, because you can acknowledge and resend, each device actually gets the signal, resends it up to three times, so it can reach farther into the house if you're, your wiring is not so good. And they have what they are called APs, uh, which are access points, which are used to jump from one face to the other. And they also jump, let's say, behind a UPS. If you have a UPS, it basically is a new power line as far as those signals are concerned. They can't jump from one side to the other. So the access point lets you bridge back on the other side. And that's pretty useful for that. Uh, that's an example of uh, a light switch. Um, those basically can work without any load, which means, what it means is that they take the ground wire, uh, I think it's black in here, and then you can see the neutrals in white here, and they can be powered from the house without the load, the light being on. In this example, this switch actually may not have to be plugged into anything, it's just powered, you push on it, and then you link it to another switch that actually has the load somewhere else in the house. So this is really a remote control that then sends a signal to your house, to the other switch that says, toggle yourself on or off. And that way you don't have to run wires all the way around your house when you want to control something in a different room. So Instant, um, I'll probably, this is probably more interesting now to people who don't live here, so I'm going to go through that slide <laughs> quickly. Um, basically it does go to Mr. House. Mr. House does all the queuing and processing. It's not like Extend where you can just fire and forget a code. You have to send a code, wait back for the ACK, if after one second you don't have the act, you send it again and again. And actually, at Mr. House, you can set as many times as you want to resend. And that means that you need the Mr. House logic. Uh, initially, when I looked at Mr. House, I was like, why do I need all this Perl and all this crap just to send a light switch on and off command? And the answer is you actually do with Mr. House, anything that has, uh, sorry, with instant. Anything that has state, uh, you need to keep track of it. And you don't want to send five commands on top of one another. So it has queuing logic to take care of all that. Z-Wave quickly, I mentioned it because it's actually sold in Australia, which is a plus. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this one is only wireless. It's more complicated to set up because you need a master controller and you need to make a special network of who's broadcasting to which other switches and so forth. But once it's set up, um, it can actually work uh, without any, uh, without using your wiring to send its signals. And on, in this case, the plus here is you can actually buy it. So that makes it win here. One wire. Um, one wire was initially designed for, I think, mostly embedded systems, cars and things like that. If you work with Arduino, those little temperature sensors you have on them that look like transistors, they're actually one wire. Um, one wire means you use ground and then you have one wire for signal, which can be both signal and voltage or a third wire for voltage if you want it to be a, more, a bit more reliable. And one wire is really freaking awesome. You have everything on that. You have basically the, te the basic temperature sensors that cost about $3 a piece. And then you have AD converters that are plugged into anything you can think of. Uh, you can get wind, solar, UV, uh, moisture, humidity. I mean, you know what, AD, obviously once you have an AD converter, you can put anything you want into them. And they're all made, you can just get them shipped to your house, you plug them in, they work. Um, one wire is an inter interesting network though, because it's not um, a star network. Oops, wrong, I'll wait for a second. It's not a star network, it's actually really a long bus. So when you're going, from your PC, and you probably have, like if you have CAT5 wiring, I go through one CAT5, I reach my far away sensor, and I come back through two other wires back to my PC, and I loop them into another one. So I have a really long burst coming in and out of CAT5 wires. That works to about 1,000 feet. Um, it's cheap because the, the PC interface only costs about 30 bucks. You can't go wrong with that. Uh, but w if you have anything wrong with your bus, well, then it stops working. So a better way is to get a, a hub, uh, have a picture of that afterwards. And those hubs let you cut it into seven different branches, which makes things a little bit easier. What I am racing, if you do have questions though, feel free to ask. Um, okay, so that's what uh, the USB interface looks like. There's also a serial one, and that's what those little transistor looking devices are. Um, I recommend you buy one of these, by the way. The blue thing is, which lets you take a Cat5 cable and split out the pairs and for t testing and debugging, it's super useful. That's another shot of uh, the sensor, and that's why I was thinking about two wires. I have one come in and one come back out. And the hub, uh, that one cost, I think, about 50 bucks uh, from Hobby Boards in the US. An example of a moisture sensor, if you came to the previous talk, uh, this one isn't made with two nails. It does cost a bit more money, but you know, it's 30 bucks, so you plug it in. A uh, little AD board that has uh, also a temperature sensor built in. Uh, the big problem is because this is outside the house, you have to keep it waterproof, uh, which tends to be difficult when you have wires coming out. Um, and because it has a temp sensor, it's actually nice to put it in the ground too, so you can measure the temperature of the ground in addition to the moisture. Um, this would be the UV sensor here. Um, you can see my superior work on waterproofing here. Uh, <laughs> which turned out not to work, actually. It looks pretty secure, but really it's not. That stupid water still came in and started eating my Cat5 plugs over there. And it's not like I get that much rain, but I still have to redo it. And how you interface to all that. So the motor of Pearl, as you probably know, is there's more than one way to do it. Well, that's the same thing for Mr. House and all those uh, interfaces. Um, you can look at it later, but basically you have XAP, XPL, uh, 1YFS.PM, which is a, a module inside Mr. House. And the one I wrote, which basically uh, logs everything to a file so I can graph it, I can replay it later, and then I can query it. So in this example here, I'm using my little script to actually query the value of the temperature in the family room, and that reads the last value for my log file. Otherwise, um, this is just uh, syntax in case you want to use it later, but that would be how you define Mr. House. An XPL sensor, which is a special uh, broadcast bus, that's the actual ID of the, uh, the DS18B20. Um, and then you just tell Mr. Hoff, this is going to be called closet temperature, so I don't have to write that stupid ID every time. And the code here will say, if the temperature is more than 85 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry for being in a country that hasn't heard of the metric system yet, um, then I turn the, the, the closet fan on, and I log, I log the event so I can see what's going on. 
so there's even more. Uh, so we can do everything you want with one wire, but some devices like uh, for weather, uh, rain, wind direction, speed, and so forth, then turn, to, turn out to be pretty expensive. The other problem is that one wire, as the name implies, has at least one wire coming back in. And people have found out that uh, lightning on things, poles sticking out of their house, goes back in the PC and fries everything, and not so good. So I don't have much lightning where I live, but um, wireless may actually be a better solution. Um, of all the research I did, uh, the Oregon Scientific WMR200 is an old, cheaper uh, uh, package which has all the sensors you want. They have, um, they have solar panels, so they actually don't, you don't need to go on your roof and change the batteries all the time. It's actually pretty good for that. And they have all the sensors you want, indoors, outdoors, barrel, wind, temperature, everything for 200 bucks, including the console. So I thought that was pretty good compared to the other options. Then the console itself can be uh, connected to your PC via serial port to log all that data, or you can use the RFXCOM, which is really a receiver antenna that can decode all those signals and plug that into your PC, which is what I'm doing. So I have the console in one room and the receiver in my wiring closet. And yeah, the idea is you can buy extra, sensor, extra senders to so have multiple places to measure the temperature in your house. Of course, in my house, I mostly use one wire already since I don't have the lightning and rain problem. So that's kind of a, an idea of what it looks like. So every, one, every time you want to know what the temperature is, you just climb on your roof and you can read this. <laughs> or, because it's wireless, you just put it in your kitchen, which is, I guess, what it was designed for. Uh, superior hacking to make the rain sensor more uh, effective. Um, it has those little buckets that are like this. So if it gets enough water, it flips with the weight, and it keeps doing that. But it takes a fair amount of water to actually flip. And I'm kind of annoyed that a little bit of drizzle didn't get registered. So this is actually a big solar panels. Uh, solar panels, all the rain comes down. And the idea is for most of that rain to fall in here so I can trigger it with the fifth of uh, the rain that it would usually uh, register. And that way I can know. Oh. It kind of works, but as you can see, it's not super perfect, but whatever. <laughs> All right, XPL. Um, so the receiver I'm using, I'm sorry, there's a lot of terms and words. It's more useful if you look it up later if you want to work on it. Um, XPL is basically one way to get all the sensor data and send it onto a bus, which can be on your LAN. And then any other device on that LAN can get that data. In my case, I'm using it for the, the weather sensor or the wireless stuff because the receiver, um, the best way to interface with it is to use that protocol. Then I listen to it and I can log it to a file like that. So you can see the rain, you can see uh, the wind speed. Um, and the very nice thing is it even has a barrel sensor if I can find it um, right here, yeah, into the mercury. And barrel sensors tend to be pretty expensive, but with theirs, it's like 20 bucks, so can't go wrong with that. Thermostat. So of course you want uh, to be able to control the temperature in your house, or at least know what the temperature is. Uh, turn off your thermostat if you're not home automatically, or if you left on the trip and forgot to turn it off. And in my case, I'm also using that to actually know when the house fan is turned on, so I can know whether I want to boost uh, the air in some ducts with some booster fans. So I don't want to do that if the main house one is not running. And that's a, I can use a thermostat to find out when it's activating the house fan. Uh, the company I got mine from is the HAI uh, um, company. Uh, the old one is the RC80, which are about $50 on eBay. They have newer ones like the Omnistat 2. They're all nice and shiny with more bits and displays and so forth. But quite frankly, it's about the same thing. It just looks a bit nicer. And this fully integrated Mr. House, um, I integrated, integrated the code for that. So you can fully control it. You can program it on the web interface as opposed to going plus, plus, minus on the thing for about half an hour. And you can save it, too. Um, and then when it works, you can know, OK, I'm on my couch. It's a bit warm or cold. You can change it and reprogram it on the fly or know when it's running and for how long. So that's the exa example of what it looks like. Um, I'm. Are you guys also using 28 volt AC for uh, thermostats and furnaces here? Sorry? Most people don't have it yet. You don't have heat or cooling. You open the window. <laughs> we have the aircon, but we don't turn it in. All right. <laughs> so you open the window and build igloos. Good for you. 
So for the rest of us, we have to worry about weather. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so that, that's basically what you can get. I went for cheap for most of it because cheap is good, of course. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is graphing with cacti, which is basically an interface to MRTG to uh, get some graphs up quickly-ish. Um, so this tells the, the, uh, the pink and the red actually show me when the furnace itself turn is turned on, so I can know when it's going on. And then I can see the temperature uh, changing in my ducts, because of course I put temperature sensors inside my ducts so I know what's going on. That would be for forced air. Uh, so that's how we do it in, uh, in California. And then you can see when it's being activated, in which duct is actually the air is going, for how long, and how it's rating the temperature. So that's kind of useful when you want to debug whether you should be having more air in one room, uh, and for how long your furnace is running, and stuff like that. So more code, uh, just very quickly to show you an overview. Um, you can basically query the thermostat to say which kind of thermostat are you, how smart are you. Uh, and then you can see, okay, I'll get you temperature, you have the temperature indoor and outdoor. So it, the, the thermostat itself doesn't know how cold or warm it is outside, but I do with uh, my sensors. So I can actually feed the thermostat the temperature outside, so it will then display it. Uh, so when I walk by, I actually know, oh, it's, the temperature inside is this, and it's that outside. So Mr. Hoff is actually doing that gateway for me. And of course, I can log all the temperatures, how long the thermostat was on and off, and stuff like that. Power monitoring. See, so if uh, you came this morning and saw that uh, little power monitor, um, I found a company called uh, Broltec in Canada. In Canada. Um, and if you want any kind of power monitoring for your house, I would greatly uh, recommend this little guy, the ECM 1240. For, 12, uh, for 200 bucks, um, you actually get seven different uh, circuits that you can measure. It will measure, of course, the voltage, the amps, and it will do the power factor by looking at the difference between the two. So you have very uh, precise monitoring, and you can tune every little CT, I'll show you the pictures later, um, and get very precise use of what you have in your house. Then you can use serial internet or uh, Ethernet or Zigbee uh, to connect back to your PC. I just ran a cable because it was already there and easier. And it kind of does need Windows to just set it up the first time, but after that there's Python code to get all the data from it. So that's what those little guys look like. You can see my superior wiring and wrapping skills here. Um, the, um, the power is actually an AC to AC converter. So that way it basically brings it down to 12 volts, but it still has the sine wave, which is the important part because it does use the sine wave to know what phase you're on and then to compute the power factor for each of your uh, loads. And that's basically what the little CTs, current transformers, look like. They look, when the current goes to the wire, it makes a magnetic field, which is detected by the little ferrite. And it can tell you how many amps are going through that wire. They make bigger ones like these. Those actually can clamp on and off, so you don't have to take out the wire, which is useful when it's your main 200 amp circuit coming from PG&E or your uh, provider. Whereas those guys, they actually need to be, uh, you need to take the wire out. Just to give you an idea, they're about the size of a dime. They're pretty small. And they cost, I think, those are actually $2 a piece, which is pretty cheap. And that's the result of what you get. Um, you have those uh, five aux and the two main channels. The two main channels are actually a bit smarter because they are directional. And they will keep track of how much current went one way and the other. Uh, in our case, we have solar panels. So the first channel here is uh, PG&E or, uh, or meter. And you can see that we only, we actually use negative two uh, kilowatt hours. But the important part is how much do we produce and how much do we use in the house, which you wouldn't have otherwise. And then you can make really cool, pretty graphs uh, like these. Uh, so you don't just know you're using two kilowatts. You know that you're using two kilowatts because um, if you're not colorblind, um, the computer closet here is using 200 watts. Then you have this big piece here, the Myth TV. And I can tell that how big it is that the, the, the plasma TV is on, which takes a lot of power. Um, the garage fridge is on. Then the orange here shows the kitchen fridge is also running at that time. And then the pink at the bottom is showing that the lights are on, which at 2 a.m. means, uh, I guess, someone was still up with the lights on. So you don't have a thing where you just say, why am I using so much power? You actually know which piece is what and what's in your house is sucking power. 
All right, great. So all that data, well, what should you do with it? So of course, the cat was an example of what you can do. Um, we do get the data just because, because, well, we can't. But really, what can you do? Um, graphing, really, I found graphing all my temperatures, all my data is very useful to come back. Sometimes it may even be a year later. But for solar panels, for instance, I can see how well they did. I can see if they're, over time, are going down in efficiency like they're supposed to, but by how much. I can uh, correlate how well they're doing compared to um, how much sun we had and the, the length of the day and stuff like that. Uh, the electricity use, of course, uh, you can keep track of whether your computer that was using 200 watts in your closet 24-7 is now using two, 260 instead of 200. That might mean that your disks are not powering down anymore. Um, if your fridge is powering on all the time, it might mean the compression might be going bad. But outside of electricity, uh, you saw the moisture sensor outside. I don't have smart uh, sprinkler controllers yet. They do have I.O. Uh, relay, the relays that you can buy, but my requirement is I want my system to work without the PC. So if I just put little relays that are controlled by the PC and my PC goes away, then no more wiring. Of course, we all know that PCs never die or crash, but still, I'm not gonna take chances. Uh, my computer closet has a fan to exhaust temperature. I'll show you that later. And I make it run like a fridge. It just controls temperature for that. Uh, and then controlling lights based on motion sensors, it's kind of an obvious one. You walk around your house, uh, just like John was saying, you know, I shouldn't have to push a light switch. It should just do it for me. But the logic becomes quite interesting between raccoons going around and multiple light switches and sensors. You don't want your light to stay on. You want overrides and stuff like that. So the closet temperature, to give you an idea, um, so this is the main, Mr. House is the main event loop that goes maybe 10, 200 times per second, depending how fast your PC is. You want to be careful that your code doesn't sleep or do anything like that, because that will stop everything else from being processed. And that's one run run through the loop. Um, so new second 122 means every 122 seconds, I'm going to do something. If the temperature is less than 75 Fahrenheit, um, then I will turn off the fan. If it's more than 85, I turn it on. And then I'll look here. If it's going down, I'll make sure that the temperature is still slowly going down. Because let's say it's too warm in my house. Since I don't have AC in the closet, I could run the fan forever, but it couldn't, wouldn't be able to cool the closet anymore. So I make sure that from the previous time to the this time around, I'm still making progress in cooling. And of course, I love all that for debugging. So it then looks something like this. Um, the blue is, of course, the fan being run. That's the temperature of the closet. And you, that's the temperature of the house outside the door. So you can see as it's going down, uh, it's taking longer for the closet to get warm again, and it's taking less time to get it cool. Also, the cool thing, it's yellow, it's kind of hard to read. Uh, yellow is actually the temperature in the attic. So when I'm exhausting heat from the closet, it actually warms up the attic during that time. Um, another example of composite graph with cacti is this is actually showing uh, power use. And I was trying to, warn, I was wondering where my fan, where it was plugged on what circuit in my house. And so I could monitor what's going on. And I tried all of them. And eventually I found out that the, the lights is actually what it was plugged onto. And I can see that the, it's using about 5 watts or 7 watts every time it turns on. So, uh, yeah, part of the talk was it said saving money and probably that's the only piece I got ended up in the short title. Um, so in California, we do have uh, temperature issues from time to time, and that would be four or five months out of the year. Um, AC costs a lot of money. Uh, the, temperature, the, the good thing about uh, measuring your power con uh, consumption is that you have data, and then you look at the data and you say, oh, crap, my AC is using 4,000 watts, and it's another 1,000 watts to run the house fan. So I'm 5,000 watts in for as long as I'm running AC. So you're saying, oh, OK, what can I do about this? Well, at night, of course, the air gets cooler. So you would want to have all the doors open and have some draft in the house at night. Uh, but leaving all the doors open and windows at night, not so ideal. Uh, even if you're in a safe neighborhood, you don't feel so good about doing that. Um, and even having them open, you need to put fans to have the air go around. So you have to do it every time, take it out in the morning. As John said, you know, life's too, too short for that. So um, 
what, what I did in my house was to have the HVAC system allow air from the outside with a, uh, basically a duct going outside and, and some um, clamp so that I can control. And since I know the temperature outside, I know the temperature inside, I looked at the difference. Then I look at the weather forecast for tomorrow, which is taken from a, a NOA website, which Mr. House has code for, so I don't have to decode that. So I know how warm it's going to be tomorrow. I know the temperature difference right now, and if it's going to be more than X degrees tomorrow, um, and the air is cool enough, then I start bringing cool air from outside. So I still have to run fans, but only cheaper fans, that I don't have to run the AC compressor, and I'm that way able to uh, cool down the house at night. Oh, and by the way, if I'm, I, shouldn't want, I wouldn't want to be doing that if the AC is running. So I have more code to see if the AC system turn on because it's so freaking warm that it turn on at night. That could happen. Um, so that's an example of those dampers. Uh, you can control those little things with just uh, 500 milliamp here, and that's the one wire going back to um, a board. I have an input-output board that's controlled by one wire, so I can just open and close relays easily. Uh, the cooling code is really complicated, so, well, it's just too complicated for a slide. So, if you're actually interested at all, you can look it on, on the web page. I do have uh, short URLs because the actual URL you can click on doesn't quite fit on the slide. But if you download the slides, uh, you will be able to get uh, the full link. And that's an example of it uh, running at night. Forget the little white stripes, that's actually a graphing bug. But you can see, uh, obviously, the, the temperature going down in all the different rooms. Uh, Okay, maybe I have a bit too much data, but it looks nice. <laughs> and what the temperature is outside and how well it's working. And as soon as the sun comes up, boop, it shoots right back up. So you stop doing that. Smart designs. Um, so when you're all by yourself, you're single, you're like, well, it's easy. I'll just put a relay and I'll have all this. And I'm always home. And if I'm not home and it breaks, I don't care because I'm not home. That's fair. As long as it's not feeding your cat or your fish, you're good. Um, when you're not by yourself anymore and you have children, a wife, other things like that, they're not going to be changing your Perl script to adjust your code if it doesn't do the right thing, even if you ask them nicely. Or maybe you don't want them to adjust the Perl script. I don't know which one of the two. Um, and quite frankly, there's user interfaces. RE light switches are designed for that. So you want to design something where you use regular controls, regular light switches, a regular thermostat that people can use like a normal device and that you can read from and override from the PC but otherwise they run by themselves. So if the PC dies, which never happens, especially not when I'm gone for Christmas and the power supply blows up, uh, while my wife is home and calling me about why nothing works, um, then you can at least have basic stuff work like light switches or temperature. So yeah, local control is important. Um, then we have a few Arduino talks. Well, actually Arduino is a good idea for things uh, that just need to keep running. If I'm, let's say right now I'm using my PC to control booster fans, I do have a lot of logic that I'd like to keep in Mr. House, but for things that need to just run when the PC is not on, you can have an Arduino board to just take over and keep running when the main expensive, complicated a device that's supposed to run it is not doing the right thing. And the other piece also is, yeah, what happens if you rip out that computer, how much of your house is still going to work? Um, you may move and sell it one day, so you have to keep that in mind. So Mr. House Program Tips, uh, that's mostly for you to look at it later. Um, but I was mentioning there's a main event loop. As a result, you don't want to sleep, uh, which is an easy thing you are tempted to do because that stops all the other processing from working. Um, you write Perl code like you usually would, but there's some evil magic in Mr. House that takes your code and rips out some of it and takes it out of the main event loop. And by doing that, it only initializes your variable once. And then each time around, it can uh, just run the code that needs to be run every time. <coughs> but there's a little thing, like if you're doing my var equals one, that's going to be taken out of the loop, and it's not going to be reinitialized to one every time. So what you do in that case is have my var, and then var equals one on the next line. You can also control code by saying no loop at the end or have a no loop block like that one, and that, that, that gets taken out. So you can do a logging this way uh, to the main log file or to a different log file. Um, that's another example of blending code. So there's a lot of really useful code in Mr. House, like, you know, 
is time now sunset or sunrise, right? I give it in the configuration file uh, lat and long longitude, so it knows where I am on Earth. It knows exactly where sunset and sunrise is where I live. From there, I can use uh, that to know whether I need to turn lights on and off. I can even do fun math like sunset plus 30 minutes, which is actually a fair amount of code to do if you're doing it yourself. But it just magically works, and that's really nice. In this case, uh, this is taking pictures in my garage to make sure that uh, the garage doors, if the garage door has been left on or uh, I'm controlling it remotely, um, I don't have a way to know if it actually works. And it's kind of bad to get it wrong. Or if you have a little small child that got eaten by the door or something like that. So I have a camera that uh, takes pictures of that. Um, and I can check on my phone if my door has been left, left on and off. Or if my cars are still there, in case you were kind of worrying uh, why you are not home. Well, yes. My backups equals multiple. You just said the previous slide not to do that. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so <coughs> you're correct. I'm getting away with it here because I'm not changing it. But you're right, that should actually be up at the top. So the, the problem is if you actually are changing the variable and need to reset it, then it's oh. not going to get reset. Uh, but you're correct. Good spotting. Someone actually read the code. <laughs> Um, so in this case, it's looking at, okay, uh, so it's my, the light in my garage, that's an instant uh, device. I'm actually querying to know if it's on, and I have two lights. So if any of the two are on, or actually three lights, then it means I have light in my garage. Or if there's light outside, 30 minutes after sunrise and before sunset, it means that there's enough light that I can take a picture. So I do. And here I, I'm not, uh, I'm not shy. I just forked off to Shell, and I did the double you get, um, and then I grab my picture and do whatever I want with it later, spool it. Otherwise, at night the garage is dark, and every five minutes I'll actually turn the light on, take a shot, and then turn it back off afterwards. Just that. Uh, so references, uh, lots of, I've talked very fast about lots of things, uh, just to give you a quick overview. This in the slides, which I know are tr uh, truncated, but they are actually visible and clickable if you download the slides. Uh, this has all the links about everything I talked about. Uh, a few thanks to all the people who helped uh, with all the interface code in Mr. House. There's really so many things in there written by many people uh, which made all this possible. So thank you to all those guys. And then we'll have questions. I'll, I'll show some other um, graphs and things while we do questions. So feel free to, to ask. I'll take that away. Hi, Mark. Yes. Um, with the power consumption data you've got, uh -huh. have you found anything that you didn't expect? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every time we do that, um, first of all, it's kind of the like uh, those are examples, um, my computer closet, this is a backup, and this is the backup being down, done. So you can see I'm saving like almost 100 watts just to spin those drives and copy data and keep all the CPUs busy. Um, but I was always wondering on my PC, how much is it taking when it kind of cools down and stops doing so much processing? So that, that helps with that. Um, now the, this was actually a kernel compile of my laptop uh, in the kitchen, uh, so that actually shows that it's only using, so it's pretty impressive for a laptop, it's using uh, 20 watts to compile a kernel, whereas if it were my server, it would be using probably, probably 100 watts to compile the same thing. So all of the story is compiled on your laptop. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, this was actually charging a battery, uh, and you can see how the charger like tempers off at the end. That's kind of interesting when you're curious. Um, that's how much the plasma, plasma TV is using when you turn it on. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a pretty cool TV. Holy crap, it uses how many watts? Um, how your fridge is doing. And this is the 4,000 watts I was talking about uh, for the AC system. The red part is the compressor. The green part is uh, just the house fan. So I wasn't expecting it was using nearly as much, especially the house fan, 1,000 watts to just have air through your house. And that's not cool or warm, just pushing the air around. I have lots of graphs on my solar panel page uh, on 
you know, how quickly it ramps up. You could actually see which trees I have in my house that are stopping the sun in the morning. And just a general, you know, oh, I could have a report every day that tells me how much power I was using the next, the previous day, and I can come back and say, wait, what happened there? So I can drill down and see why. Um, like my wife's lovely rice cooker, which then, it turns out is taking about a thousand watts to keep uh, rice warm at night. So that was uh, <laughs> nice to know. Um, and yes, so I probably answered that. Next question. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I noticed with your talk and also the uh, previous one from the NICTA guys, mm -hmm. there's, I guess you spend a lot of time thinking about um, where you've got inputs and then your, or, or different conditions, and then you're actually hard coding the sort of actions to them. Uh, any of these sort of, I guess, home automation systems thinking of, or, or looking at, uh, I guess, more intelligent uh, learning type systems where, for instance, you know, it learns that, um, you know, your, your sort of behaviour, particularly, like, I guess, with heating and cooling, you know, like that, you know, certain days of the week you, you get home later or you get up earlier and, and those sort of things. Have you, have you seen people, doing research into making systems that learn, learn from behavior and, and the way you use systems? Right. Um, the problem with learning is it works when you kind of do the same thing. Um, but I found that just having the override home automation is already a lot of logic. And when you start learning, if you have multiple people coming in and out, um, and then the cat moving and stuff like that, it makes the motion sensors unhappy. Um, it's just by the time you have it all good, uh, let's say my wife trying to change her jobs and she starts working on different days, now everything is wrong so she has to override it and, and then I hear about it. Uh, and then it takes a house wife for the magic code to actually f figure out that things changed. And I, I, the more I looked at it, the more it didn't seem like a good win. It seemed like a lot of code to write and when you have more than one person who's always doing the same thing, it didn't sound like a great uh, win. And if it's just you, it's just a whole lot quicker to just say, well, this is when I'm here, this is when I'm not, and have an override if it doesn't happen. Yes? So I was just thinking about your um, comment on the, the new and shiny version of the X10, the one that has state. Yes, interesting. Now, for us to be able to do anything like that with stated home automation systems, we basically have to use CBUS, which is about a billion times more expensive. So I was wondering, with your comment about it not being available in Australia and New Zealand, could you please say that with just a little more sympathy? Could I? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So there's, um, I went over the extent slide pretty quickly. That's the I.O. board, the, the one-wire I.O. board, by the way. Um, I believe there's some extent vendors that have made extensions to the protocol. Uh, which are just for their devices, where you can actually send a smarter command and get state back. It doesn't make, make the protocol more reliable, but you can keep polling, and if it's wrong, you keep sending the value back. But with X10, it's pretty common to, when you want to turn a light on or something that's important, you send it five times. So you're hoping one of them is going to get there. It, it doesn't work if your fridge just turns on for 30 seconds and the motor just messes up everything. But it, if you put filters, it usually works well enough. Filters is basically... Uh, you put it behind your UPSs, your motors, and stuff like that, and it will clean the power so that that, that, that motor going on will not send crap all over your power line. And it, it helps with that problem a little bit. And otherwise, Z-Wave, Z-Wave is more expensive than uh, Instant, but not insanely so. Right. Um, otherwise, you make your own. <laughs> Wow, okay. I'm very sorry. Yeah, that, that is not reasonable. Also, it runs separately over Ethernet. It doesn't port over. Like, you have to run only 45 to every Oh, okay. That, that's kind of ridiculous. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's not going to. Okay. Okay. Um, well, find something better, sorry. I was just going to say that's probably about all we have time for, but um, Mark's happy to take questions during the break. Um, just like to present you with a small gift from sure. the Thank next you. conference. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.